Well, good morning, church, um, th and thank you, choir. Uh, I don't know that there's any better way to get a service started than that, um, and I'm afraid I can only mess things up from here, so <laughs> I'll keep my part uh, short and sweet. So first, let me uh, welcome you here this morning. We're grateful that you have chosen to come and spend your time here with us, uh, here at First Baptist Church, uh, and with the Lord. This is a special morning, as we will have the Hanging of the Green, and we will all have the chance to participate together as a communal body in that uh, hanging. You will need an ornament, if you do not have one, and a candle. Um, if you did not get uh, either of those things when you walked in, uh, you, it's not too late. Um, you can grab them uh, as we do the hanging of the green. We'll have a time where everybody stands up and um, comes to hang your ornaments on the trees. We have a tree up front, two trees, and one tree in the back. And so if you did not get a candle or an ornament at that time, um, you can grab one then. Um, we'll have those at both, all of the locations. Um, so this is the second Sunday of the Advent season, uh, where we celebrate Jesus' first arrival, and where we look ahead in anticipation uh, of his promised return. And on this second Sunday of Advent, we celebrate the peace that Jesus brings to us. Um, peace with our fellow man, peace with ourselves, and ultimately peace with God. Jesus truly is the Prince of Peace, and so we celebrate him as such this morning. And so as we get started, I want to remind you this morning that we are um, in this season taking up the Lottie Moon Christmas offering over the next few weeks leading up to Christmas. Our church goal is $18,000, and if you aren't familiar with what this offering is or where the money goes, uh, it goes directly to support international missionaries who are partnered with the International Mission Board um, so that they can share the gospel and the love of Christ with those around the world who are in desperate need of hearing it. And so I thought this morning with the theme of the second Sunday of Advent being peace, uh, that we could spend a moment praying together uh, for peace around the world. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are the God who gives peace. You give us peace that surpasses all understanding, even in times of uncertainty. And we are able to have the fullness of peace in our hearts this Advent season and every season of life because Jesus, the Prince of Peace, your Son, sits enthroned at your right hand in heaven. Father, this second week of Advent, keep us in perfect peace as our mind stays on the truth of your love. Thank you for your mighty, sovereign hand. Help us to trust fully in you and rest in the peace that you offer. Savior, we pray now that you would enable us to live together harmoniously, both as a church body and in and among the broader community as a nation. And Lord, bring peace throughout the world. Father, we pray specifically now for those who are suffering from the ravages of war. Please be with your people, and please bring pre peace to uh, specifically Ukraine. We long for the day when swords will be exchanged for plowshares once and for all. We know you are faithful and strong to accomplish this. It's in the precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen. joyful and triumphant and we invite everyone to join in uh, on this wonderful wonderful piece uh, it's accompanied by handbells in the loft and uh, by Ian on the organ and so let's stand and sing and I'll bring you in at the right time hopefully <laughs>
For us unto us a child is born, to us a son is given. The government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, Isaiah 9, 6. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. John fourteen twenty seven. As we come today to light the second of the Advent candle, candles, we are reminded that our Savior, the light of the world, is also the Prince of Peace. Though his life was never free of conflict, he taught us much about peace. Long ago, the prophet Isaiah, nearly 800 years before Jesus' birth, was given a glimpse into the mind of God to see that a day would come when peace would reign among the kingdoms of the world. Isaiah never saw that day, neither have we. Torn by strife, personal, national, and global, we know the heartache of a fractured world. That's why today, in preparation for this holy season, we need to be reminded again of our Savior's promise. It's not that we will all be free of conflict or confusion. Instead, in the midst of every storm, people of faith can experience the calming presence of Jesus as he calls to the raging winds, peace be still. Please join me to pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you today for the seasons of the year, for bringing your son into this world to bring us peace. We light this candle with the pledge to live peacefully as he lived and to be peacemakers in the world, in our country, in our homes, our work, and our church. Amen. Wonderful group of children here at First Baptist, and they've been working hard to prepare some songs for you today. First, we hear from our Melody Makers Choir. There are three through, three through five-year-olds directed by Celeste Henley. She does a wonderful job with these children, and they are beautiful. If you can get them to stand still, they will be beautiful. Look at that. They look great. So as they, as they come forward from their seat, they are decorating our communion table where there are already a stable and some animals, and they're placing the nativity figures in that stable. And then they're coming up to the steps where they will sing for us. First, glory to God, hallelujah, and then Christmas bells.
Amen. Thank you, children. Now we'll ask that any parent of one of these precious children just stand where you are so they can see you and join you for the rest of this service. Thank you so much, children. Now we're going to join together and sing a carol of Advent, hymn number 77. It's Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. Stand with me as we sing. seated. Our young musicians choir, our first through fifth graders will come and sing for us now. They have a wonderful group of children and they're directed by Janie Thompson. After they sing for us, they will decorate the sanctuary with greenery and candles on our beautiful stained glass window ledges and then they'll be placing the poinsettias on the steps. Listen as they sing.
it is that time now that uh, we will decorate our sanctuary with beautiful greenery, wreaths, garlands, candles. So at this time, we would ask for you to stand to your feet. If you brought an ornament, you can bring it to any of these three trees at the front. There's also one in the back foyer. You may decorate that one if you're in the back half of the sanctuary. If you did not bring one, one should be provided for you. So you may begin moving at this time. Hang the green. Entrance 
Good morning. It feels like Christmas time, doesn't it? So a couple weeks ago, before Thanksgiving, the kids were out of school. I took a couple of days off work. And I wanted to get the kids out of the house for a little bit. Give Micah some free time to do what she needed to do. And so I made plans to meet my parents with my two kids in Hot Springs and watch a nice matinee movie. And so they said, sure, that sounds great. We'll meet you there in Hot Springs and watch a movie. You pick the movie because you know what the kids want to watch. And so I started to look through all of the movies on offer. And there really weren't many options, not many kid-friendly ones, too. There was this one that sounded really friendly called Smile. But we didn't watch that one. Sounds like a happy movie. We watched the newest Marvel movie. because That's what we do. We've got kids. We've watched all of the Marvel movies. The newest Marvel movie is Black Panther 2. We liked Black Panther 1 quite a bit. So it just made sense. So I said, OK, we're going to watch the newest Marvel movie. This is, I think this is the 174th Marvel movie, by the way. And so I told my parents about this, I said, hey, we're going to go watch Black Panther 2. It's a Marvel movie. And I dreaded the question, even before it was asked, what's it about? Because <laughs> my parents have watched zero Marvel movies, none. And this is the 174th Marvel movie. And so there's a lot of story to pack in there. And I don't even know where you start. And so I left that question to my children. And I said, you're going to have to explain this to grandma and grandpa here. Nana and pop don't know what's going on. So you're going to have to clue them in. Because I didn't even want to attempt that. Because it's complicated. It's a little mysterious, somewhat enigmatic, trying to explain what a Marvel movie is about this late in the game. You know, the only thing I can think of that would be more complicated would be explaining what someone's life is about. I can't explain Black Panther 2, what it's about to my parents, and I would have a hard time, I would struggle to explain what you're about as an individual. Because we're all complicated, we're all mysterious, we're all a little enigmatic. Maybe I should just ask you, what are you about as a person, as an individual? Is there a lot of backstory there? What are you about? Is it complicated? How do you use this life that you have been blessed with? Or do you use it to bless the people around you? Or are you more of a curse? Should I ask your coworkers and your family? What are you about? How do you use the life that you've been blessed with to point people to the light of Jesus Christ? What are you about? This morning, I want to tell you about two of my favorite people. I'm going to try to do this briefly. And consider this my Christmas gift to you, a short sermon, and all, it's just what you wanted, I know. We'll see, I'm not making any promises yet. I want to tell you about two people who are not as mysterious, who are not as hard to figure out. Two people that if you spent any time at all looking at their lives, you would know very quickly what they're about. Two people who were so tangled up with Jesus that you cannot talk about them, you cannot talk about their lives without talking about Jesus. I want to talk to you this morning for just a few minutes about John the Baptist and about Lottie Moon. Now, you may have heard both of those names. They both have pretty stellar resumes, okay? Jesus said about John the Baptist some pretty great stuff. He said about John the Baptist, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. That's a pretty good pull quote for John the Baptist biography. Doesn't get much better than that, does it? If you, Jesus says that about you, like of all the people who've been born, nobody's greater. So worth your time to spend a little bit of a moment or two talking about John the Baptist, seeing what the scriptures say about him. Lottie Moon doesn't have that kind of quote from Jesus about her, but we name our annual Christmas offering after her. You heard her name already in this service, Lottie Moon Christmas Offering. It's an offering that we take up this time every year. Us and churches all over the country take up money 
at the Lottie Moon Christmas offering and give it to support our International Missions Board. Missionaries all over the world do what they do, funded by that offering. So how did her name get attached to that offering? What's so special about her that I'd want to talk to you about her in the same time I'm talking about John the Baptist? Well, let's get into it. Let's talk about these two. I want to start with John the Baptist. You know a little bit about him. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 3. If you don't remember anything about him, let me give you a little primer here. The scriptures tell us that he is the son of Zechariah and Elizabeth. Elizabeth, who was a relative of Mary, the mother of Jesus. So right off the bat, you hear a little bit about John the Baptist, and you find out that he's related to Jesus. Okay? It's that great story in the Gospel of Luke, one of my favorites, where pregnant Elizabeth, pregnant with John the Baptist, goes to see Mary, her relative, and she's pregnant with Jesus. And when she comes into the same room as Mary, when these two pregnant women are like right next to each other, that John the Baptist, we're told, leaps in Elizabeth's womb, which just sounds cool and uncomfortable all at the same time. It's like, I don't know, some of you have done that before, you, you know what that would feel like. That may be more painful, I don't know. But he leaps in Elizabeth's womb. So excited he is to be near Jesus. That's an incredible thing. You know what the scriptures tell us is basically that John the Baptist, for the rest of his life, is going to be leaping for Jesus. He spends his whole life, everything that he is, all of his words, all of his actions, every ounce of him goes toward pointing people to the light of Jesus Christ. You cannot untangle him from Jesus. Matthew gives us a pretty good intro to John the Baptist in chapter 3 of his gospel. He says this, In those days, John the Baptist came, preaching in the desert of Judea, and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the desert, Prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. Let's stop right here and talk because there's a whole lot in those opening verses here in chapter 3. There is a fulfilled prophecy in those verses for crying out loud, so let's talk about it. The prophecy here, let's start there. That's a good place, good as any to start. It's a prophecy from the book of Isaiah. You heard Isaiah read earlier during the lighting of the Advent candle. We talked about Isaiah a little bit last week. You may remember what we talked about. You may not. If you didn't, you're in luck, because I can tell you. About 800, 700, 800 years before Jesus lived, Isaiah was doing his thing. He was one of our great prophets. And he did two main things. The first one is he called God's people out for their sinfulness. He called them to task for it. He called on them to repent. That is to turn away from their sins and turn their hearts instead toward God. That is the essence of repentance. That's what he called God's people to do. They didn't do it, but he spent a lot of time calling them for him to do it. The other thing that Isaiah did, that we, the reason why we talk about him so often during this time of the year, is he spent a lot of time giving prophecy about a coming Messiah, about the one that God would send to save his people, about Jesus. Part of that prophecy that Isaiah tells us about includes this prophecy that Matthew mentions here about John the Baptist. He tells us that there will be one who comes before Jesus, a voice of one calling in the desert, one who will come before the Messiah to prepare a way for him, to make straight paths for him. Matthew tells us that that is John the Baptist. That is John the Baptist. That John, his role in life is to come before the Messiah and prepare the hearts of people everywhere to receive Jesus, to get them ready, to prep the road for him. This is what John is doing out in the desert. This is what John is doing with all of his words, with his life. 
with his very self. He is making much of Jesus. He wants people to be ready for him. He wants people to know him. He wants every fiber of his being to exalt the name of Jesus Christ. And so he gives up all of the comforts of life. He gives up all of the things that make life real cozy. And he heads out in the desert and he wears funny clothes and eats bad food. Anybody bring locusts and honey today for the potluck? Maybe one year we'll get this. <laughs> I think Whole Foods maybe would have that. I don't know. It's not hard to figure out what John the Baptist is about. He tells us. You know, a little later in, John chapter, or in Matthew chapter 3, John tells us what he's about. He says this, I baptize you with water for repentance. But after me will come one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not fit to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. This is, uh, this is John. John the Baptist telling us what he's about. His purpose in life is to point people to Jesus. I baptize you with water, he says, but there's one coming after me who's so much better than me. And he's going he's gonna to give you what you really need. He's going to baptize you with the Spirit of God. John wants all of his words, all of his actions, his very life to prepare people for Jesus. He even prepares the people in this passage who are the hardest to prepare. You know who those people are? The religious people. They're always the toughest, right? Especially the religious leaders. They can be the worst. They come out to see John in the desert to check him out, see what he's about to assess the situation because he's drawing quite a crowd. The Sadducees and the Pharisees go out to see him. You know what John does? He calls them a bunch of snakes. You vipers, you vipers, repent, he tells them. Repent and repent and mean it. Real repentance, not just saying it, but really doing it. Having some kind of repentance that actually bears the fruit of repentance. True, true heart change is what he calls them to. And it sounds harsh, and a lot of people think John the Baptist and think just harshness and bluntness. But you know what I chalk this up to, this kind of harsh dialogue he has with the Sadducees and Pharisees? I think this is what they needed to be prepped to receive Jesus. They needed to be called out for their sin, for their hypocrisy, for the hollowness of their faith. They needed to hear something difficult so that they'd be ready to receive the Christ. John did everything to point people to Jesus. This is what John the Baptist is about. You know, I didn't always love John the Baptist like I do now. It took me a little bit. And I'll tell you what unlocked my love for John the Baptist. It was when I realized that John the Baptist is kind of like our best missionaries. If you think about what he did and how he lived, there's a lot of like a classic missionary person in that. You know, I think of Lottie Moon, for example. She and John the Baptist had so much in common. We need to get one thing out of the way first. You know, I brought more stuff up here today than I typically do, and I got no place to put it. It's like the one Sunday there's no pulpit here. I got no place to hide anything. I brought a tape measure. I was going to, in case some of you are wondering, I don't know if you saw it or not. Did you see it or did I hide it? You saw it? Some of you saw it? Okay. Um, I was going to measure this, the length of this service real quick, if that's okay. Uh, some of you are like, we already got it. We already got it. Uh, Lottie Moon, before we go any further in talking about her and what she did, she was four foot three inches tall. That was the top of Lottie Moon, right there, all right? I think that's pretty, that's pretty cool. You need that visual, okay? So Lottie Moon, 
she was a missionary to China during a time when the Southern Baptist Convention didn't really send out a whole lot of single women. But when she was 32, she went. She answered God's call. She went to China, and she lived there for the rest of her days. She came back a time or two on a visit, but not to live. She gave up wealth. Her family was really well off, she would have really afforded her a lot of comforts in life. She gave all of it up to go and live in a part of the world that many people that she grew up with probably would have considered the wilderness. They probably would have looked at the clothes she wore living in China and the food she ate as something akin to locusts and honey and old sackcloth clothes, camel's hair and all that. And she went because she wanted to lift up the name of Jesus. She went because she loved Jesus more than she loved comfort, more than she loved anything else. And that's why you can't talk about Lottie Moon today without talking about Jesus. She gave her life to making Jesus known in China. She sought people out there. She went to the remotest villages telling people the good news about Jesus. And many came to the faith because of her life and ministry. She lived it out, folks. She gave of herself. She was Jesus to these people in the sense that she sacrificed herself for the people she went to minister to. You know this? You know how she died? Lottie Moon? She died on Christmas Eve. You know how she died? She starved to death. There was a famine where she was living in China, and she didn't go home to the States where there's plenty of food. She stayed there, and the food that she got, she didn't eat it. She gave it to the people she was ministering to. She loved these people. She wanted them to know Jesus. She wanted the best for them. They say she weighed about 50 pounds, the point where she passed. She died on Christmas Eve, but that's not why we name our Christmas offering after her. You know, she had the idea for a Christmas offering, like the one we take up still. She died in 1912, I believe, by the way, just to kind of give you a little frame of reference. She had the idea for a Christmas offering. She, when she was in China, talked to folks back home and said, you know what, you ought to take up some kind of offering. People in the church is there. You ought to take up some kind of offering this time of year because this is the perfect time of the year to point people to Jesus. And there's some people who could tell you something like that and you'd say, yeah, yeah. But boy, she meant it, didn't she? Her whole life, everything she did, everything she said, every fiber of her, of her being was given to point people to Jesus Christ. It's easy to know what Lottie Moon was about. You know, these two titans of the faith, John the Baptist and Lottie Moon, kind of loom large, if you ask me. They set a high standard. An offering after somebody, you kind of do that. You kind of put them up on a pedestal. But I don't think they would have liked that, either one of them. You know what I think they would have liked? I think they would have liked it for us to join them in making much out of Jesus with our lives. I think they would have liked it very much for us to follow their example in as much as that would lead to more people knowing Jesus, to the name of Jesus being exalted above every other name. I ask you again today, what are you about? What have you done with this blessing of life you have been given? What are you about? Can people talk about you without mentioning the name of Jesus? It makes me wonder what would happen in our church, in our city, in our world if we gave everything, all of our words, all of our actions, all every fiber of our being to lifting up the name of Jesus. It makes me wonder what this world would look like. I wonder today, 
what you can do during this Advent season to lift up the name of Jesus Christ, to point others to his light. Will you pray with me? Kind Father, we love you so much. And God, we thank you today for your great love. We thank you that you loved us so much that you sent your son to die for us so that we might live. God, you are so good. And I pray that this light that you have shared with us, the light of Christ, would not stop with us, but that you would give us opportunity, the means, and the boldness to pass that light to someone else, to point someone else to you. We love you so very much, and we thank you today for Jesus. Amen. Does everyone have a candle? Let's get this out of the way real quick. I'm going to try hard, really hard, to tell you, room mostly of adults, how to light a candle and not sound condescending. Actually, uh, let's see. Colin, come on up here. Let's give him a demonstration. If your candle is lit, Colin comes to me so I can light my candle. Colin can't tip his candle over and light my candle. I have to go to him. Okay? And then the next person will have to do the same. If you tip it over, it's like wax, and it just doesn't work, okay? So let them come to you. But here's the deal. As we, you can go ahead and lower the lights. We can do this part in the semi-darkness. Here's what I want you to get today. Because I love candle lighting services. It's quaint. It's beautiful. It's cozy feeling. But it's not just about lighting a candle and feeling cozy. It's not just about getting a warm Christmas time feeling. It's about something. As we share the light this morning, I want you to consider the light of Christ. God loved us so much that he sent his son into the darkness of this world, a world made dark by sin and death. He sent the light to us. And as we share the light with one another today, I want you to consider a couple of things. The light of Christ now in you and how you might share that light with someone else.
Oh, this is nice. I wish you all could see this. Do you want to take turns? <laughs> Come up here. Yeah. Uh, so listen, we have one more thing to do. Um, I'm tempted to say leave your candles lit, but I don't want to burn the place down either. So let's extinguish the candles. And you all can have a seat for just a moment. I need to introduce you to a couple of folks, Chad and Dahlia Lankford. We didn't have uh, a regular, thank you, a regular invitation today, but we do have people who want to join. And so I thought we can make that happen, right? You all okay with that? All right. Oh, you can clap. You can clap in a minute, too. It's all right. Uh, <laughs> uh, talked with Chad and Dahlia, and this is Avery. And Molly's down the hall, I'm guessing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so they, the Lankfords have been visiting uh, for a good, good bit now, most of the year, and just recently have decided they want to make their connection with this church family a little bit more official. I had a good conversation with both of them last week, and... I uh, heard their testimony that they have put their faith in Jesus Christ as the Savior and Lord of their life. And they come from different backgrounds. So uh, Chad is coming today as a candidate for baptism. And we're very excited about that. And Dahlia coming today on a statement of faith. Uh, but church family, what we need to know is this, and Molly's going to get here right about the time we're we're done. Is that okay? Yeah. You'll get a, we're, we'll let you go to the potluck early. How about that? That's good. Anybody else want to join now? Uh, all right. Uh, so here's what we need to do. I need you all, church family, to let them know that you're here for them, to make your support for them, your excitement about this decision, and your commitment to them, uh, make that audible with a loud amen. amen. All right. So here's what we're going to do. I'm not going to make you stand up here. Uh, we do have a potluck here in just a moment. Uh, if, as you see them around, get to know them. Let them know who you are. Uh, see how you can be a good neighbor to them, a good brother and sister in Christ. So we're so glad about this. We're going to schedule a baptism, I believe, in the new year uh, for Chad, and you'll be hearing more about that. So you all... Um, you can maybe stand just right here for just a second or have a seat somewhere up here. Um, here's what we need to do. Actually, you can stand. Don't sit. Can everybody else stand up? There you go. It's a lot going on today. Uh, if you need to break a little bit early and get in the potluck line because you have some reason, something that keeps you from being able to stand in line for a long time, other than impatience, uh, this is your opportunity to go. If you have a young child down the hall, take advantage of it. This is the only time that's a perk. Uh, <laughs> just kidding. Uh, but do take advantage of it. If you've got a little one down the hall, go get them. Get in line. Make life easier on yourself. We're all okay with it. We've been there. Uh, all right. This is your chance to break early if you need to. Everybody else says they're breaking early. Uh, if you're a guest with us today and you didn't know we were having a potluck, we want you to stay and eat anyway. You don't have to bring something. If past potlucks are any indication, there will be plenty to eat. So stay and join us for this. Also at the lunch, besides delicious homemade food, uh, we have people signed up to provide Christmas-themed entertainment. So there are a lot of families, individuals, uh, duos. It's going to be great. So you want to stay for that? Have we given them enough time? <laughs> Have they cleared out? All right. If there's anybody else, you better make some noise. I can't see you. Okay. So I think we're good. Um, Lankford, y'all go ahead and go on as our guest. Go get in that line. You'll be glad you did. Okay. All right, for the rest of you, Merry Christmas. It really does feel like Christmas today. I know there are things that happen right after Thanksgiving. Trees go up, decorations, Christmas movies and all that. But for me, it never really feels like 
Christmas until we get to the hanging of the green. So Merry Christmas to you all. I do pray that each and every one of you would know the presence and the nearness, the goodness of being close to God today. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Are we singing? We're not singing, so let's go eat. Amen.